All right, everybody, uh, grab your seats. Uh, turn it down. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Besides Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm here to introduce our next talk. Uh, we have Peter Chestnut. He's going to be talking about DevOps, uh, securities, big opportunity, as shown on the slide behind me. Um, <clears throat> Pete uh, is the Director of Developer Engagements at a secure code analysis and probably a lot more than that uh, company <clears throat> uh, with over 10 years of direct AppSec uh, practitioner experience as both a developer and a development leader. He has a lot of really great background. Um, he's a really great guy. I've heard him talk many times in the past. Always something interesting to hear, so I definitely uh, hope that you uh, pay attention. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Pete now with his talk on DevOps. Thanks. Here on. All right, so this is a brand new talk, so it should be interesting. Oh, we don't have the timer set up yet. I miss my time. I got you. All right, thanks. All right, a little bit about me while he uh, set that up. Been doing this for 25 years as a software developer, so I come to information security, application security from a developer practitioner point of view, but obviously working in a company like Veracode, a ton of AppSec experience. Um, I, so I've been in Veracode almost 11 years now. Worked in Agile, worked in Waterfall, worked in DevOps. I've moved my company, uh, Veracode, from Waterfall through Agile to Secure DevOps from a monolithic application to a microservice-based application. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I consult with some of the biggest companies in the world about rolling out a, a good AppSec program, uh, sometimes about their DevOps and Agile uh, practices themselves. And if you ever want to get my attention, invite me for some whiskey. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, so a quick set the stage here. I mean, this shouldn't be news to anyone. DHS says 90% of the attacks that we see in the breaches have something to do with the application layer. That's not necessarily applications that we build. Sometimes it's applications we buy, but we should think about the security of all of the applications that we're running in our, in our infrastructure. Also, the, the biggest thing that I see from customers or prospects, actually, who's a very good customer here? All right, thank you. And everyone else is a prospect, awesome. <laughs> the biggest thing I, think I see is they say, hey, we're just going to do our tier one applications, our most important ones. Okay, great. And now that's kind of like the Maginot line of security. Anyone familiar with that term? So yeah, World War II, French built this wall to keep the Germans out, but they didn't go all the way, so they just drove around the wall. Brilliant. This is the way AppSec is typically done. We'll just do the important ones. So you see things like Target, which had nothing to do with Target.com or anything like that. It was some HVAC contractor's billing site in the Target, and that's how they got into their networks. Or some charity event, JP Morgan Chase built uh, for a running event um, in our open source community too. So I'm not saying that open source is worse than first party, it's about the same, it's just we don't think about it very much. All right, so who has an application security program today? All right, who wants one? So, is this your AppSec program right now? <laughs> right? Or this? This is kind of what I also commonly <laughs> see. Right to the quality draw. Right. <laughs> and there's a couple of different outcomes. So that gate that you saw previously, a lot of times I see this. They come to you at the end for their security attestation. They say, hey, here's my release candidate. And you go, yeah, I found a whole bunch of stuff you're going to need to go fix. And then they start the phone calls up the chain all the way up to someone that's powerful enough to call you to say, hey, we're releasing this anyways, I'm sorry. I have not seen that before. Or, if you've got a real gate, now this is really cool if you can get this, most companies can't, this is what happens. <laughs> Ramming speed, or ludicrous speed. They, they crash right into the gate, they don't think about it, they hope that they can get through it. All right, so times are changing around the way applications are developed, and this is why I'm here giving this talk at, to a bunch of security practitioners. We need to think differently about how we app, approach our application teams and our development teams and how they build software so that, it, that way it can be secure. And if we look at the release timelines that we're seeing, and th these are ballpark averages, uh, typical what you will see. Waterfall, you're looking at one to four releases a year. Hey, who's doing waterfall here in their shop or knows that they're doing waterfall? One, a couple, rocking back and forth. Uh, big teams. I was on teams with more than 50 people, sometimes more than 100 people working on these projects. Right? They're huge efforts. Move to Agile now, we're shrinking that timeline 
and we're shrinking the team size. And this is really changing the way we have to adjust for these teams and the way we need to train them. A couple releases a month now we're talking about, and team size is six to 12. Uh, by the way, you're gonna see Agile a lot in DevOps. So these, aren't, these are two related things. Usually using the Agile methodology to run your DevOps operations. All right, so DevOps, now we're talking about hundreds of releases a year or more, sometimes 10, 50, 100 times a day, depending on what shop you're working with. And the same team size, again, you're usually typically running that Agile methodology on top of that. All right, so how did we get here? So back in the day when we had Waterfall, Right, we had these walls between everybody, and I'm gonna stick security over here in quality because I think of security as equal to quality. We would hand off over the wall, right? Development's done, pass one quality, quality's done, they pass one operations, et cetera. And the problem with that is once we've written our specifications and have a plan from our product owners, we lose the fidelity as we move farther down the line, we're playing telephone. Similarly, our, our developers are building these applications and why they built them that way and the decisions they made and, and how they expect it to run is also lost as we move farther down towards our production environments. Similarly, upstream feedback from our operations people, they know how it runs. <coughs> Who here is in operations? Sorry. <laughs> They know how it runs. They have scripts to go fix the things that we didn't do right. Oh, I gotta knock this process over every couple of days because it runs out of memory otherwise. All those stupid things. But those don't make it far enough upstream for us to do anything good about it. So hence we moved to Agile. We said, all right, well let's knock down some of these walls. Typically the first walls you break down is you'll stick your product owner, your developers, and your quality people on the same team. And that's awesome. So now we've got some really good fidelity around our business intent and application knowledge. But that other wall is still there. We still think it's somebody else's problem to operate our software. So that upstream information is still getting lost. Move to DevOps now. In DevOps, we have really, really good continuity across uh, the spectrum. The operations people are in the room talking to the developers about how the software actually works, listening to the business problem that's being solved, so everyone has this good information about how it's supposed to work and what it was supposed to do. From a technology point of view, and this is largely driven by the timelines, if you're talking about waterfall, if I have to do something once a year or twice a year, it doesn't matter how much it hurts, I'll just do it that way every time. There's no economic benefit to me to go automate that process. But when we get into Agile, we start talking about something that was six months to a year, and we're now moving that down to you know, a month or two weeks. I need repeatable processes that I can run when I need to, no matter whether somebody's sitting in a seat, particular seat with their hands on the keyboard or not. Once we get to DevOps and we're trying to release things as they're done, I need to automate everything, absolutely everything. All right, who's familiar with Agile? Oh wow, a bunch of people. All right, for those that aren't, quick primer. Over here we have our product owner, a guy with the light bulb, or gal with the light bulb above their head. They create what's called a backlog. This backlog is a prioritized, ordered list of all the stuff that they want us to do, the team, okay? And what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna take that into a planning session, usually a grooming session first, where we're gonna look at this stuff and say, do we understand what's being asked for? really important part of this process. Um, so let's say my scrum team is uh, down here in this first row, we're gonna, the product owner is gonna describe the feature and say, hey, here's what I need, and we're gonna do something called planning poker. Uh, this is a Fibonacci-ish sequence of numbers from zero, it's already done, to one, to uh, half, to one, to two, <coughs> three, five, eight, 13, et cetera. It's relative sizing. So two is twice as big as one, et cetera. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to say, on three, show me your car. We have actually physical cards, you can do it on your phone, but it's more fun with cards. So we're going to show the numbers in. I get a one from this guy over here, I get a 13 here, a zero there, and a 20 over there. I'm like, whoa, we really don't understand this. The whole point of that exercise is to get us down to the point where everybody understands, because it might not be just one person's job to go do this. We're not assigning the work right now, we're trying to understand the work. 
Once we do that in our planning session, we're going to commit as a team to what we're going to get done for whatever this sprint is. A sprint is a time box duration, usually two to four weeks, two to six weeks. And we're going to talk every day, 10, five to 10, 15 minutes. What did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? What am I being blocked by? So we can identify opportunities to help each other. We're going to track that, sometimes on a board, usually electronically. I'm going to, at the end, say, hey, did I get everything done? We're going to do what's called a retrospective. And I'm going to say, what went well? What didn't go well? How are we going to change to be better? This is the continuous improvement process that's built into that. Now, typically, this is my security guy here. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're doing it right. And what ends up happening, especially in those previous cases, is they're fighting for budget. Right? They come to us with a release candidate and say, here's 100 things you need to go do. <coughs> well, can I just do the most important ones? Which ones are those? Yeah, that's why I gave you a list of 100. I need them all. Well, what if we just did the top five? So you're fighting for that budget at the end when it's the you know, worst possible scenario. They're ready to go out the door. All right, so let's talk for a second about what DevOps actually is from my perspective. Here's a quote from Nathan Harvey of Chef. I love this quote. It is an organizational-wide change. It's how you run a high-velocity organization. Right? I need to change everything. If I'm releasing features daily, maybe my support people need to get trained differently. Maybe my documentation people need to work at a different pace or work differently. Uh, my product owner certainly needs to be filling a queue faster than he used to because I'm not boxing up this functionality. You have to change the way you think about this. And, by the way, we can't white knuckle releases from the security point of view. Everything can't be pen tested. That world doesn't exist anymore. I'm sorry. Sorry to say that. It's still valuable. I'll show you where I think it should go, but we can't do that for everything anymore. So here's a typical DevOps cycle. Okay, uh, everything from when I thought of the idea and planning all the way out and monitoring it in production. Now. I hear lots of people talk about the DevOps team or the DevOps guy or gal. This is not what I think of as DevOps, right? So here's what they think. So operations people, the people that move the software to production, that's not really getting after the whole problem. It has to be this. You have to have a team that is responsible from cradle to grave for the stuff that they build. Because I'll tell you what, a developer thinks differently about what they wrote when they have to monitor it and operate it. When they have to go write those scripts that say, oh, geez, I gotta knock over the servers again because I'm running out of memory. Well, maybe I should code that a little bit differently. Maybe I should go fix that now, right? If I'm wearing the pager and I'm the one getting woken up, I'm gonna think differently about some of the things that I do. Similarly, security. Now, from our waterfall days, and from the way these tip companies typically bolt security onto the end, here's where we end up sitting. Horrible place. All the damage has been done. We're only just pointing it out to them. Right? We're turning ignorance into negligence. This is what we need. We have to be there when they're planning. We have to do things with them. Help them understand the threat actors. Help them understand the design decisions that they're making. So here's my strategy. I, I, there were six items. I kind of paired them together because I think they logically go together. First is relationships and accountability. Second, training and remediation coaching. And thirdly, security champions and right size testing. So we'll start with relationships. Who, all right, so who's in the security, uh, so who here is a developer? Let's start with a couple, excellent. Quality? Nobody? Wow. Okay. Noticeably absent. Uh, we already did our operation people. All right. How about people that are responsible for application security? Sit with those teams. Awesome. So uh, put your hand up if you're in uh, security or in development. You see both your hands at the same time. All right. Now put your hand down. No, keep it up. Put your hand down if you don't know someone, your peer in the other part of the organization. Don't really use the security peer in your other organization. <laughs> so a bunch of hands went down. We have to work together. Now, in my model, right, those people are all on the same team. That's not always possible and that's not always practical. 
Sometimes security has to be on the outside, that's just the way we're organized and we're just gonna have to deal with it. Okay, fine, but that doesn't mean I can't have a relationship with that person. I have to know who they are. They have to be a real person with real problems. Do you understand how they're gold? This, this is gonna come up again. What are they gold to do? Because if you look at your typical developer, it's move software fast. That's it. Operations people are keep production smooth, right? Security people are secure the stuff, whether that be your, uh, your boundaries or your applications. Those are all in conflict. We have to share the same goals. If they don't have the same goals as you, that's something interesting to know. Because when you go to them to say you need to fix these things, they're like, no, I don't. I need to ship this software. That's all I care about. So understanding their struggles, and we're going to go in a little bit more depth on this as well. And do you meet with them? If you don't, you should. Lunch. Lunch is okay. Drinks. Whiskey. <laughs> a whiskey buddy down there. Yes, another one. Excellent. Take them up for a whiskey. Get to know the things that they're struggling with. Having a face to the role is critical to us working together. I usually, uh, so one of my first companies, every time we get into this conflict in a meeting, the VP would say, all right, everyone pull out your business cards. See this? They're all the same. We're all on the same team. So it's critical that we think that way and remember that. You need to be a little bit more sympathetic to the stuff that they struggle with. Yes, the SQL injection you found is critically important and we do want to get that fixed. Yes? I was going to say, if you want to make your ops people happy, tell them they're ops is hard to It's very telling if I, as an ops person, request a ticket whether or not I get any story points assigned to it. If I need something fixed but I can't get story points assigned to any grouping, I'm going to assume that I need to work around the fact that they're not going to work. So, excellent point. Uh, the, the comment was like, hey, if I. If I put a ticket in and I'm not seeing any work get done on it, it is frustrating. The, the, the question you need to ask is why? Yeah. It's not because they don't care about you or what your job is. It's because they're not gold for that. It's all, it also could be I simply don't know how to submit the ticket properly to get it work. And that and might be too. I want to know it so I can do it properly. Right. But we, but, so I will counter that with I can't sit on the other side and just be a curmudgeon about it. I need to go have conversations. So hence, Having these relationships is critical. Thank you for the comment. All right, accountability. I have never seen an AppSec program get after remediation if there is no accountability for the people that wrote the damn software in the first place. Okay? If I'm buying software from vendors and I don't have it written in the contract, that by the way, you've got to fix the security stuff that you, you put in there before I'll take ownership of it and pay you for it, what is their incentive? They're just going to bill you for that as extra work. Uh, usually you can wrap that up into the quality clause and say, hey, we think about security as quality, and you might be able to get away with that. But think about that in your contracts. Um, security and development need to share the goal of securing the software that we make. It's the company that gets the black eye. It's not the security team. And by the way, the security team didn't make the problem. The developers did. And I'm speaking to you as a developer in application security. We're the ones responsible for it. We should take accountability for it. And you see that more and more in this DevOps model as we, as we look at becoming more uh, multidisciplined engineers. So having to worry about quality and operations. And by the way, I'm containerized, so I need to think about IT and systems engineering that I never had to think about before. All of those facets need to feed into that team as requirements. So, best way to do this is to change the way they're paid. They have goals. Everybody typically does in an organization. Do the developers have any security goals? If they don't, I might want to start there. Because you're going to get maybe a real fast if those measurements are going to hurt their pay at the end of the year. You've got to measure it and report it. Okay? Look at where we are. And, and look, when you onboard and when you baseline your application, to haven't already, you're going to find a whole bunch of technical debt out there. Big surprise. The fact is, you're not going to fix it overnight. You didn't get there overnight, and you're not going to fix it overnight. Sometimes the software is 5, 10, 15, 20 years old. 
and has security vulnerabilities in it. Okay, fine. Yes, they're also in production, by the way. Can we mitigate against some of that? And what pace are we going to get after this? We can't shut down the whole company, shift to security, and do security for two years. So be practical about it, but understand, we are where we are, and let's try to get better at it. All right, huge one here. So this is from uh, Veracode's State of Software Security Report. We measure because we've scanned over two trillion lines of code across thousands of customers with tens of thousands of applications, uh, the kinds of things that help them work better and faster. Training leads the way. Six times difference if you train them. For the developers, put your hand up if you were a developer. And keep your hand up if you were trained in security as part of your career, as part of college. One, two, all right, a couple. I did this 25 years ago. They didn't have application security back there. Back then, uh, most people are coming out of college with little to no knowledge of application security unless they tinker in it. Okay, the the people, the majority of your workforce has never been trained. We have to take that on as a cost of doing business. We have to teach them because I would rather them write secure code than have to chase them with my tickets. Where my ticket guy goes? <coughs> He's gone. There he is then chase them with tickets around the stuff that they screwed up. It'd be much better for it to come out of their fingers secure, and we can help them do that. We have to be present for them, okay? We have to train them. Now, this is a measure of uh, people that use e-learning versus not, so that on-demand training is great. Um, think about that. Think about doing it in an instructor-led way. So what I love here is uh, take a look at your security policy, Take a look at what your applications are actually doing in production and say, hey, look, SQL injection, big surprise, our biggest problem. So I would fill this room, the stage, with pizzas. Now, you got to do this in the right order. If you try to fill it with developers and then pizzas, it doesn't work. If you put the pizzas in, the developers will come. So if you promise them food and it's there before they get there, they will all gravitate into the room. And then guess what you can do? You can stand up here for an hour while they're, while they're feeding themselves and talk to them about a specific thing that is hurting your company today. It isn't the secure Java coding course, which has its merits, but it's not the best use of their time, especially if you're trying to get them to the point where they stop doing the things that are hurting you the most. So measure those things, build some training around it, give it to them. It's a low cost way of getting a high impact on the team. Anyone familiar with these books? All right, familiar, how about who's read them? Okay. Good, excellent. Get these books. This one first, <laughs> and then DevOps Handbook. Um, incredibly valuable in helping you understand the problems that these teams are facing. And there's actually some security events, even in the title. Agility, reliability, and security in technology organizations. You'll see some repetition, and this is all about, anyone heard the term shift left? <laughs> A couple. This is the whole idea in the industry right now. The same way we did shift left with quality. So when we went, when we moved to agile, we said, okay, let's make quality part of the thing that developers have to worry about. So we'll make them think about it earlier by doing things like test-driven development. Now quality is front and center. Guess what? I got better at doing quality. We want to do the same thing with security. We want to give them the tools to be able to measure that early and get better at it over time. Next, again, they're not experts. Uh, to your point, exactly about they don't understand. Well, where the hell are we? We should be available, or we should provide services to them that help them fix the things that they're finding. They don't know what a cross-site scripting uh, error is. Who's there to help them? Are we, do we really want them out searching on Google for, for this information, or we would rather provide them something? Maybe we can write some security code that wraps some of this stuff. It does the right input validation and says, hey, and this is what I would call the paved road approach. I am going to provide you some libraries that do some of this stuff for free. If it's broken, it's my problem. If you use it, I will support it. If you don't, then you have to fix these things yourself. Okay? So this is a place where we can pitch in and help them get more secure faster. Again. They don't understand they need a place to ask. And it can't be, uh, I'll get to you in a couple of weeks. So some companies provide services around this. 
to provide that kind of remediation guidance on how to think about this. Okay, next one. Security champions. This has become very common. I talk a lot at DevOps conferences, I talk a lot at InfoSec conferences. Um, people are using this term very broadly in the industry. This is a way, uh, so who has a security organization more than 20 people? Okay, well, more than 50 people. Uh, who's got the uh, red team, blue team? Ooh, wow. Okay, well than I thought. A lot of these times we go to these customers and these prospects, and by the way, one of them was a privately held company that if they were on uh, the S&P 500 would be like uh, one of the top 10 biggest companies on the planet. They had one guy, one, I, my job is application security at this multi-billion dollar company. Like, whoa, that sucks. <laughs> We need a way, and by the way, these teams should have you know, 50 or more uh, security people. How many developers are you trying to support with that? Hundreds, thousands, typically, right? We can't possibly be in all of the meetings, all of the places. So what is done, and this, I have a different talk on this, but to, to briefly give you this, they become the eyes of the security. On every single development team, there should be at least one of these people whether it's a superman or super girl, so I don't mean to be sexist on this one. They need to be there in the meetings, part of the development team. Right? They're not the security expert, but they're more expert than the rest of their team because we're going to give them additional training. We're going to talk to them about the basics of security. We're going to talk about CIA. We're going to talk about threat modeling. Um, we're going to talk about and give them some set of grooming guidelines. If it looks like that, it smells like this, then security. Right? If it's a form field, then you need to worry about these things. If it's a HTTP header, here's what I'm worried about. Help them be able to take those, turn those into acceptance criteria inside of their stories so that way they can make sure that security is taken care of and talked about at the very beginning. Teach them how to do secure code reviews. Now, they're not going to be able to catch everything, but there's some small set, and you can build this over time, of helping them understand what to look for and what to do about it. Okay? This is training inside the team now. Also, the red flag ones, right? If it touches my crypto, if it touches my auth n, if it touch, touches auth z, any of those things, security, and probably pen test. Okay, so some of these things, absolutely positively pen test, period. Okay, and they need to know that, and they need to take that to that meeting, because they need to think about how they're gonna bundle that software and get it to the customer. Now we also do something at Verico, uh, we do CTF exercises with the developers who so will show up in the cafe, everyone's got their laptops, there's our exercise today, let's go be hackers. It's super fun for developers to go and do this and see the other side, and it helps them think more defensively about how they code. Understand that they have limits and they need to understand their limits. When it gets beyond me, I go to one of my security guys. Okay, if it doesn't fall into this list, if it doesn't fall into that list, then come talk to me because we're going to do something different with this. So this should capture 80 to 90% of the stuff that happens every day inside of your software development organization if you train them right. So here's a, a strategy around doing this right size security, right? Like I said, we can't always be pen testing. Training all the time. We are constantly training our developers, and you should too. I want to start doing some of the tools so these tools can find security violations easily, quickly, and cheaply, a lot more cheaply than the calendar and money time it would take me for it to go get a pen test and go do something. Static analysis, third party, open source risk. I want to understand that as soon as possible. The day they start writing code, I want to start testing it. When developers start seeing these tests come back and they're coming back dirty, they take a lot of pride in their work. So they're going to go start fixing these things and asking you questions about how to prevent them. Dynamic analysis, the second I got something that's up and running, I just want to look at it from multiple angles. Like I said, it's not to say that pen testing isn't useful. Uh, I, I might do some, anyone heard of RASP, or time application self-protection? So this is a, a up and coming technology. But here's the security team. Huge role, big important job. Helping in the very beginning. Notice we're here, we're not all the way down there and testing and staging, right? Doing threat modeling and secure design reviews. We're here in the middle, biggest section, helping them fix what they find. 
What's the point of a security program if we're not fixing stuff? Right, if we're not reducing the risk to our company. And at the end, main authentication testing, our red blue team stuff, that's all valuable. It takes that role down out in monitoring and, and in production land. All right, so here is an example. Everyone, has anyone not heard of CI CD? Just heard the term. Anyone not? Any, all right, we're going to go through one, anyways. So here's our backlog, again, my scrum team. Pick up and develop. Now, the way I think about this, I break this into the, in the kind of two pieces of static analysis. And you notice I haven't done any check ins yet. It is a really important point here. The stuff that they're doing in that last diagram, the day they start coding, is what I would call educational scan, educational analysis. Right? It's a constant, quick feedback. I made that mistake, I made that mistake, I made that mistake, and then the next time maybe I start thinking about it, and I don't make that mistake anymore. Versus something that's farther down the line before I check in where I want to check the whole application. Does everything look good, not just the code that I just wrote? Again, before checking. This is part of in uh, what Agile would call the definition of done. Did you do your static analysis? Make them document it, right? Because if you find something later on in your assurance scans and it breaks the build, well, who is the one that didn't follow the process? Now, again, back to my point about manual stuff. If you have to do manual pen testing, if you have to do code reviews, if you have to do UAT, anything you have to do that is the manual in nature requires a person before check-in. So maybe I check into a branch, I deploy it somewhere, I tell my pen tester, go at it. I don't care how long it takes you, just come back to me when you're done. Once we agree that everything's fixed and ready, then I'll check in. And now we go into the pipeline. So this is all development work. So in every check-in, in a, in a highly functioning operation where all of the tests you trust, etc., we're going to get into this CI CD pipeline. My CI server, my continuous integration server is going to come up, it's going to build it, it's going to run unit tests, static analysis, I'm going to get a result from those. Now, this is the continuous integration portion of this pipeline, right? I'm going to take the code and put it through a sniff test. Does it pass all of the, the easy testing that I can do against it? If it doesn't, I'll fail the build. Synchronize the backlog, hey guys, sorry, here's the stuff you've got to go fix now. Again, functional and non-functional, side by side, equal partners, they're bugs. If it does pass, I'm going to start moving into operating environments. So I'll go to QA, then staging, then production. I'm going to run more security against it and more testing. So I'm going to do some regression testing, some dynamic analysis against it. Again, I get a result. If it passes, it moves to the next stage. If it doesn't, then I'm going to break the build. This is the continuous deployment or continuous delivery portion of this pipeline. Now, this doesn't have to all be automated, but if if you want to release hundreds of times a year or tens of times a day, it has to be. You have to trust all of that testing to go right, and that when those results come back, it's good. You don't say, well, let's pull it over for some pen testing. Right? That needs to happen here. You need to identify those things early. That makes sense. Anyone have any questions on this one? Excellent. All right. So some conclusions now. You have to learn this stuff. Go get those books, read them, talk to your development teams, attend some of their ceremonies. So in, in uh, Agile, there's something called chickens and pigs. The pigs are the ones that do the work. The chickens are the ones that stand there quietly and observe. They should allow chickens to come into the room and watch these ceremonies. Understand how they build software. You should understand how the sausage is made. You gotta build relationships and you have to demand accountability. And it, it can't be the lowest level security guy or the AppSec guy that's doing this. This has to happen at the high levels. The CISO and the VP of development have to agree that this is important to the company. If it gets boardroom visibility, all the better. That will drive all the right behaviors down the line. You won't end up with tickets that sit there silently with no comment on them. They're like, well, not my work, I don't care. You have to, you have to build it into your culture that is part of what you do as, as your work. Train them. They don't know their butt from anything when it comes to security, typically. Now, they, that doesn't mean that they don't care just that they don't know, and they're all smart, and they can all learn these things, so teach them. You have to adjust to the speed that DevOps happens, right? You have to think about, 
does that really require repentance? Do I really have to pull that over for a two-week or longer review? Or can it use the tools that I've, that I've bought and built? So when you're looking at vendors and you're looking at companies to bring in tooling, you really should look at false positive, false negative rates. Is, are the results quality enough for me to say, when this passes, I'm good? Or are you always going to be skeptical? Are you always going to have to touch it? Anytime you put people in the mix, you slow everything down. When you create that friction, that's what causes developers to push away from the table and say, hey, thanks anyways, guys. We're, we're all set. Right? So you have to fit into their working style. And you have to work into their environment. I will take some questions. Yes? Yeah. How do you uh, create this model where you are producing software that you're going to sell outside, like this uh, where you know, obviously the op personnel is going to work in a different environment, but also the people the security personnel are very important at this stage. Um, how, do you, how do you onboard uh, the ops side of DevOps and security side of DevOps in production with developments in the So is this for? Specifics for software that you sell. So, sell is it software as you sell, sell as a service, service or a software that you shrink wrap and, and the customer installs? Uh, software that you're throwing over the wall to the customer environment. It could okay. be sold or it could be an open source project that's being employed. Right. So, you need to build in telemetry. Now, it might not be telemetry that you can get your hands on immediately. Right. So, if you think about this, we'll take the, the SaaS model first because it's the easiest. Right. I have all this stuff that comes into all of my offers, all my blogs, and, and other things that, that come in here that allow me to know whether the software is running well or not. You need to build that same kind of environment. I would suggest dog fooding it, for one. If you're not using it, you have no idea how it actually works. So if you can use it, then you can start thinking about what telemetry you want to build in. So that way, when a customer calls, you either have a playbook you can give them, or you, you can say, hey, drop me these logs, and it will tell me exactly what I need to know. So it, it's, it's a little harder. But it requires you to understand how your software works. And if you're doing it just in the quality environment, I would argue that's not enough. You really need to experience the pain of the, of the users. Experience the pain, sorry to follow up. Yeah, experience the pain of the users is uh, important, I agree. But a lot of the security issues that I went to, uh, involve security issues management, uh, and the security issues that I went to, or deployment scenarios environments are extremely dangerous. And uh, Yeah. Is a different organization. So, all right. So, I think I understand your question. So, this is what do you do if it's a, a different organization that does that stuff because it's running in a customer environment? Yeah, yeah. A uh, different problem. We should probably take that one offline, and there'll be a longer discussion. Uh, yes, sir. What resources uh, would you recommend for helping to get a team, say a one or two person development team up to speed with this uh, uh, DevOps? So ask the question again. To get, we're going to a small company. Yeah. A lot of times, you, what you're talking about, like teams, now look like a big company to me, but I work with, with companies that have like uh, 10 to 100 employees. So how can I get them up to speed with this uh, DevOps? So if they're going to do DevOps? So I would, uh, they first need to get good at Agile. Like I said, most of the time you're going to see DevOps run on top of an Agile methodology. So they need to understand those short cycles, the continuous <laughs> feedback loops. Uh, certainly reading those books is enough to get them started on that journey. Uh, attending the conferences, like there's DevOps days around the world. Uh, there's always one going on somewhere in the world, and, and they're regional, so they're, they're bopping around all over the place. Uh, there are lots of uh, forums to go talk about this stuff. You, you learn by doing, so back to that Nathan Harvey quote, it's, it's built by the practitioners themselves. They understand what doesn't work and they move on and try to fix that next thing. All right, I got about two minutes, yes. One thing I want to mention, I want to mention earlier on the slide, you have the word accountability does not equal blame. The operations, yes. security, QA, development, we're all the same team, and that team has one goal, and you're not a non-profit to make money. At the same time that you're pushing left on the process, the business is pushing right, because you're in a world where you've got like over the same profit margins, they want something that makes money, they want it now, and they don't want to talk about it. 
this point. Accountability does not equal blame. Yes, sir. Really good talk. One thing that you mentioned with relationships, really you want to build trust with your developers. You want them to come to you. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that means um, getting in the fight for them. You know, they're there 40 hours a week doing functional. They don't even think about the other stuff. Sometimes at an enterprise level, you have to build in programs, um, give them tools, give them training. Those are enterprise level stuff. Yep. Tools, training, trust. Yeah. Building the code for them, like I said before, that paved road approach works really well because they don't want to have to do it. Yep. So if you can help them do and, that. And learn how to do that. Go out, take training on YouTube, go to things like CodeMash, um, be a developer. Yep. Take take your time. Yeah, learn how to write code or write code and actually yeah. and then try to push it into production. Are we over time? 46 seconds. I can take one more. Yes, sir. How do you approach customer fragmentization when they're not going to take updates? Customers refusing to take updates. Well, so they're accepting risk, right? If you are releasing something that has security changes in it, look, you, you, all you can do, and look, this is the same fight that, that security has had with development, so you can think about them as customers. You can say, hey, you really need to take this because. There's lots of reasons in their organization where they might not be able to take these changes. They might have, uh, you know, change blocks where they, they can't blackouts where they can't make changes in production. All you can do is, is educate them and say, here's what's in here. Here's why it's important. You should use this, and they they have to take or not take it. Uh, they accept that risk, just as long as you educate them properly. Thank you, everyone.